I'm going to go ahead and tell anyone who's watching this, I don't know that I'm going to get a signal outside, so it may lose it. <laughs> so if, we, if we lose you, it wasn't our fault. We'll be back after these commercial messages. <laughs> Every call that we go on, um, 
there's a minimum lift of the cot of about six times. You take it out of the truck, you lower it, you put the patient on it, you raise it up with the load on it with the patient, then you put it in the truck, then at the hospital take it out. So there's, there's six different lifts that are involved with a regular traditional cot, um, which obviously someone like me that's perhaps been doing this for 10, 20 years, that is wear and tear on our back, our knees, our shoulders. So basically this is a game changer to our industry. It pretty much totally eliminates the need for lifting a patient. Um, so the auto loader, we did, we did attempt for a brand to purchase these, which did get denied. Um, but real simple how it works. One button, and you can pretty much, even with a patient on this, I could load or unload with one hand. So it pulls out. Green lights come on. I know the cop's ready. So normally, like I said, these cots are anywhere from 50 to 75 pounds. Then you add just an average person, you know, say 180 to 250 pounds, just an average person. Um, you can imagine, you know, each lift, you're two to 300 pounds that you're lifting those six times we lift. So real simple, patient sits down on the cot, we, uh, strap them in, we have the shoulder straps for safety, raise the cot up, and this cot is rated for like 800 pounds. So even if, I mean, even if you have a four or 500 pound patient, it will still lift them. So once we get back, green lights come on. One hand, the patient's loaded, eliminates all that lifting. So like I said, you can imagine back injuries, shoulder injuries, knee injuries. Not that we're not still at risk, because we still have to pick people up in awkward positions, you know, car accidents or falls. We still have to pick the patient up, but we've eliminated those six lifts on every call that we have to do. That's, so that's really pretty much it. compression device that we got. It's a Lucas device made by Stryker and it does chest compressions. A lot of times you go on a call, I mean sometimes this comes out as a you know a generic unresponsive or a fall. You never really know because you're just taking the information you get from the caller. Sometimes it's not entirely accurate. You get there and they're in full arrest and there's only two people on the ambulance. Well you can't do chest compressions, airway, give medications and somebody's got to drive at some point. So this takes the place of an entire person to do chest compressions and it runs for 45 minutes straight on the battery and we can swap the battery or we also have a power cable we can plug in to continue the chest compressions depending on where we're going. It's rare we would go for more than 45 minutes because we're going to tra transport to Wilson County somewhere here. So it's not likely we'd run out of a battery power anyways. But it just, just goes under the patient's back and then this device on this goes down to your chest level, and then it's, it'll just start to just chest compressions endlessly. So. Eliminates an entire person if you don't have that extra person. Which here sometimes it's hard to get first responders, or volunteers. You're kind of at their mercy whether you get somebody to come and be your driver or do chest compressions for you or not. So this eliminates an entire person essentially if you need to. And, uh, it's 
the only AHA approved CPR device, so it does the exact depth and rate always. So when you're driving, you can put this on somebody, put them in a stair chair, take them down steps, and since it attaches to them, it can, it'll run in this position or any position. So there's never that time where you're not doing chest compressions. You lose 10% uh, perfusion to the brain for every second that you're not doing chest compressions. After about 10 seconds, you've lost all perfusion to the brain. With us here, you never had to stop that because it just run continuously. So that's uh, two of the things that we've got. Here recently, we got another cardiac monitor coming. Yes, sir. What about the defibrillator? Do you get in the way of using one? If you can chalk with this running, you never have to turn it off. The only time you'd really stop it would do like a rhythm check. So you could stop it for a moment, it's got a pause button. See what the rhythm is, if it's a shockable rhythm, turn it right back on, shock them and keep on going. So you never have to shut it off. Does it expand? They have put it on over a 400 pound person. So it will, we have to manipulate the person a little bit to get it around them, but it will fit in a fairly large person. And, they, and the, the vendors actually put it on his 10 year old. It'll fit a pretty small even a child. Maybe a little bit smaller. It depends on their size. But, uh, this sort of yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. So it'll, I mean, you may have to like you know, manipulate their body a little bit to get it around them, but it'll fit a fairly large awesome. person. We haven't had to use it yet, luckily, but uh, if we do, we got it. Well, let's hope you never have to. Absolutely. Nice. <laughs> do you have any questions on you? Yes. Yeah. Do you have any questions? I think you can't be tested. Is there any variations in pressure for a particular age or size of people, or is it fairly consistent with the amount of chest pressure it takes to make the It's It's rated on depth. So the AHA has a particular depth that you compress, and this is, once you set it to that level, it presses that depth every time. It, will, it, it pushes that 2.5 inches every time. So regardless of rigidity, it presses that same depth. Anybody else got any more questions? If not, we'll move back inside. Is that the end of year? Yep. You got done. anything you want to talk about money or anything? Yeah, we can talk about that. I got the operation report in there. Thank All right. Thank you. <laughs>
minimum tie-up, just trying to get them there. So uh, when they enter there, because they're COVID positive, that's the reason why they're being transported in there. They got a, a COVID dialysis clinic in Gouldsdale. It's just dedicated to them. So when they test non-COVID positive, then we'll, we'll continue to transport them once they come back. So it may be a few weeks, maybe a month. It depends on sometimes people linger on for a while with some positive tests. So whenever they test negative again, we'll continue those transports. Uh, so far, uh, we're, we're maintaining our increased revenues and so far everything is, is doing well with uh, billing and recovery. Any questions on the financial? <coughs> it's a need, a need you see that you're going to have in the next 12 months? Uh, next 12 months, parking in the ambulance would be the, the greatest thing. I think we, with the new, now that we have the power cost auto loader, we're getting a new monitor. Uh, we've pretty much taken care of all the our delivery things that we needed to purchase. Uh, I think we probably look at selling the Sprinter, using that money towards a new ambulance next year at some point. What's the new ambulance cost these days? Uh, it's not cheap. Probably looking at 180,000 or so. That depends on you know configurations. And Is that with equipment or? Hopefully, that's what we're anticipating. So we're looking at, we're looking at, yeah, yeah, just under, probably 180, 190 with, with everything. So we won't need to buy a new monitor because we already got one. Right. Uh, the auto loader and the auto cost and power cost, they're, they're fairly expensive. But that's what's being required now by the state to have certain requirements on crash tests. And what we used to have in the past on the old ones was like an amber system. And some of y'all are familiar with it, just slid up into this metal bar thing. Well, those aren't crash worthy in a rollover. It'll tear out of the floor. And several people will be killed due to those that crashes and ambulances. So this new standard, this meets the standard that the state requires now for for a cost appearance. So if you say 200, it's less we're happy. You say 180, it's more we're not happy. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and we're not going to buy a big lot like Nashville. It'll take it. Or Wilson County. Ten thousand more than we'll do. Is that what brand though? Ford or Chevrolet? Uh, or we can pretty much choose whatever chassis we want to put it on. So they'll we'll pick a chassis and then we'll, they'll ship it to the company that manufactures the box and stuff that goes on the back of it. So we can choose chassis. It would be, it'll be a four-wheel drive. So we're pretty much swapping over the four-wheel drive across the board. Right? Another question? Like a 5500 or were they? Probably not that big. These are 3500s. I mean, and depending on size, it may be a 4500, just depending on, on the box size and what the manufacturer recommends on the size, but probably stay in the same area that, of that size. How many times do you go out the road? Uh, with the houses, uh, we're, we're, we're going out quite a bit. I'm talking about all the way to the prison. Uh, yeah, I mean, not as often. They, they're transporting some by van. That, are, that don't need to go by ambulance. So I'd say we're probably still going five or six times a month at least at a minimum. Would be a, a good characterization of our numbers out there. It fluctuates. Some months we're 10, 12 times, other maybe only three. But on average, I'd say five to six times a month. Okay. On your trucks that you're looking at for the new animals, mm -hmm. have you thought about doing extended pad? It won't fit in our bag. Is our problem? I was size. curious if yeah. we can give y'all a little bit more room for our size. Our bays are what's going to hold us up on on how long the ambulance can be. Right now, we're with the truck chassis that we have on the one we just brought up here is very low room. So when we go with a little bit bigger box, this common one, we may have to even move it over to the other side where we have a Richie one part and have to park it over there, depending on how long if it's going to fit or not. Because it's a little bit bigger box, it's probably going to have a couple more feet. And we're talking about putting it up against the wall if we're on the side we're on right now. I'm curious if we look at the other.
daughter said, yeah, hey, I'd like you to do this. I'm like, uh, okay. <clears throat> so uh, when he asked me to do that, I said, that's fine. And so what I did for tonight for the committee is I asked Mr. Cross if he had an opportunity to come back again from MTAS and kind of talk to us about where we are and what we can do as we go forward and some of the things that we might do to make some improvements or some things that might help us out in our, uh, as we move forward with this uh, recommendation of our next fire chief. So fortunately his mom was okay, I guess. You uh, had to take him out of the hospital or to the doctor or something. Uh, she, she takes cancer treatment, so I, I make sure I go to all, all those with her. So I had her there at noon, got through about four, and headed right here. Right. Right. So, so I'm <laughs> glad that you're here because realistically, uh, I think many of the people on the committee last time were looking for uh, the, some assistance on this. When you're looking for a position like this, you like to have uh, objectivity and, and fairness, and, and we think that coming from the state there, I think that. There's some good things that happened. There's some things that happened last go over there that weren't really as good as maybe they could have been or should have been. But with all that said, let's just, I, I think it's time for us to, as a committee, to decide how we want to move forward. And with your, some of your guys, we talked about some things that maybe we had talked about last time that didn't end up on there, but maybe we can do that this time. And just So if you can talk to the committee about some of the things that might be optional, things that might be added to this go around, it'd be great to just kind of talk to us we're all scattered. Um, well, first of all, thank y'all for having me back up here. It's always a good day. I'm in Hartsville. Um, you know, last time when we did the fire chief deal, uh, we did basically a structured interview uh, process. It was not a assessment center. Uh, we did one thing. We did an interview. Period. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we didn't review resumes, we didn't do any of that stuff. So uh, the mayor had called me, Mr. Ferguson had called me, and really uh, for me uh, to come back and do this again, I want to do a full-blown assessment center because if we just do just a partial again, and either you get the same result or a different result, then guess what, we do it a third time to break the tie or something, you know, I don't know. So, uh, you know, it was my proposal, let's go do a full, full blown assessment. Let's, uh, I think the mayor was talking about putting out the application process pretty quick. And then when he gets the resumes, he's gonna uh, send them to me. That way I can review any um, references, past employers, anything like that that I can steer away from when uh, recruiting an assessment team. Uh, you know, for instance, if, you know, I used to work in Columbia, Tennessee, so if I applied for the position, I would hope that they didn't, or maybe hope that they did, call somebody from there to come here and be the assessor. But anyway, we're gonna try to stay away from all that. That was the biggest, I think, uh, problem we had last time was maybe some references, and they were on the assessment panel. but. Um, this time I'm gonna be sort of in charge of that. I'll review the resumes, I'll look at the, the references, past employers, different things, and make sure to recruit um, an assessment panel that doesn't touch any of that, hopefully. Um, again, the mayor and I, we're, all, we're gonna communicate probably a lot more. Uh, Carly, you wanna talk about the measures we talked about doing, the different things we, um, we talked about, of course, uh, the interview process that we did last time was a good process, but it was the only process. So in a structured interview for a fire chief, I get nine ratings off of that. There's nine competencies that I test for in that interview. Um, that's an interview. Um, one of the other measures we talked about was um, like, coming up with some sort of tactical situation that would be real life, could happen any second here in Hartsfield, and work the candidates through, uh, you know, some sort of emergency situation. Um, it's very doable, it, it's fun, it tells us a lot about the candidate. Now I get one score off of that. 
And then a third thing we talked about was some sort of role play situation where the candidate would be given some sort of uh, assignment and given a certain amount of time to prepare for it. And then there would be some sort of role play situation. So um, I'll get about three or four, according to what the role play is, I get three or four of those nine competencies tested in that. So doing those three things, you know, we measured the candidates really three different directions, uh, nine scores, three to four scores, one score. So we got a lot of scoring there. And it really tells the mayor a whole lot about the candidate at that point. Uh, there had been some discussion about uh, scoring resumes. Uh, I normally don't do that as part of an assessment center. I explained to the mayor that he needs to use the resume as part of the decision making process. But every candidate that submits a resume that meets the minimum qualifications should come to the assessment center on equal ground. Now, if, if we get 10 applicants and there's four of them that score high enough to be considered competent, Maybe he uses the resumes to figure out, you know, I got four competence. I can pick any of these four, and this assessment center has shown that these were competent. Now, if you go look at the resumes and you find that one candidate, you know, has a lot more credentials or whatever than the other or whatever, maybe that's for, I mean, I don't know. I can score the resumes and provide that, but that's really not part of the, um, really not part of the assessment center. Uh, to be a valid assessment center, if you will. I mean, I score resumes all the time. When I get 40, 50 applicants for a position, I score the resumes and use that score to invite the top five or six or seven people to the assessment center. We're not going to take 40, 50, 60. You know, I, we got one working now down in Middle Tennessee. Probably end up with a couple of hundred resumes off of that. And we're not going to take that many folks through a fire chief assessment, we'll take and uh, review those resumes, we'll score them out, probably the top five to seven candidates that get invited to the assessment panel at that point. I mean, from you, from you all, tell me, I, I know what a valid assessment center looks like. I, I run them all the time. Um, I really wanna be successful here with you all and do a process that you trust, that, that you know is valid and it's fair and all these things. So, do you have a question or comment? What does a valid assessment center consist of? Well, we have a valid uh, assessment center uses valid measures, which the measures is what I was just talking about interviews, role plays, tests, um, uh, simulations, all these different things. Uh, so a valid assessment center is multiple measures. We measure them by more than one measure, multiple, and we use trained assessors. So uh, just like when we did the interview process before, uh, the first candidate, I don't remember exactly what time it was, got there maybe at one, but the assessment panel and myself got there probably an hour and a half ahead of time, and we went through a training with them to let them understand what we were doing today how we're grading this, how we how we rate the candidates, how not to rate the candidates. You know, if you have two candidates, if you have five candidates come through your assessment panel today, uh, you know, uh, me and Mr. Ferguson, and he gets a perfect score, and then I come in after him and I do better, they're not supposed to compare us. We compare the candidate against the uh, competencies that we've developed for the position. And I take the job description that y'all have and develop those competencies. And each one of those nine competency areas, I write a, a little paragraph and then uh, sort of to describe the competency and then uh, what acceptable performance is and what outstanding performance looks like. And that way, whenever uh, you know you're on the assessment panel and you're thinking, man, you know, Mr. Ferguson did a really good job. Uh, and he did a lot better than, than 
somebody else. And I said, no, 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 you can't judge them against each other. Look at the bottom of the page. This is what, you know, acceptable looks like. Did they exceed that? And the answer is yes. And look at outstanding and see how much of outstanding did they meet. And then that way, you know, if, if you meet the acceptable on our scoring system, it's a one to three. 1.00 to 3.00. You walk in the room and you have a pulse and you're breathing on your own. You're not hooked up to Mr. Bailey's machine out there. But you get a one. If you, uh, if you score at least confident in the position, you get a two. So I always tell the, the panel to start at two. Uh, you know, if I come in and sit down, whatever I'm doing, start me at two. And if I don't measure up to at least confident today, the score is one point something. It's 1.75, 1 1.83, whatever it is. If I do more, if I prove more today than that competency, uh, minimum competency, then it's two point something. So, uh, and then I always take our point system and then equate it into the hundred point system in case there's other uh, things that you guys add. Some people add like, if it's internal, some people add like uh, seniority and different things like that in on it. Um, a lot of these fire chief uh, recruitments we're doing, they may require 10 years uh, experience and you know, if you got somebody that applies, got 11 years, and somebody with 25, then you get a few more points for that extra over thing. But um, that's kind of what I have envisioned for y'all. Um, Trying to at least get a one. Yeah, I mean, if you don't come in with a one, you're, I'll be calling Mr. <laughs> be calling Mr. Beatty to come <laughs> check on you. Machine. <laughs> get that machine. Let me work the medical down. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was a good question. Though. Like I said, it's it's a uh, it's a very good process. Um, if you don't do the whole process, if you don't do the whole assessment center, uh, it's really just a process at that point. It's a it's an interview or it's whatever we do. And I like the assessment process uh, center because it it's valid. Like I said, I'm measuring you from two or three different directions by three or four different people. They've all been trained. They know what to expect. Yes, sir. This might be more of a mirror question, but what's the time frame to start this year? You're looking at? We're kind of been looking, looking at having an advertise on September 24th. I'm the personnel policy has to be advertised for two weeks. Mr. Cross has several other ones he's doing, plus a comprehensive plan for another organization. So we're trying to build in a little bit of padding as far as time wise. We looked at trying to set up the interviews about the second or third week of October. He's, he's pretty confident that he's not going to be able to have candidates scored out and everything by the end of October, so it's probably going to be submitted to the county commission in November. So we, we try to build in one or two weeks later, so if he's not as far along in his helping the other communities as he thought, or we have trouble to get his, uh, all the candidates scheduled, we've got a little bit of time there to play around with. We're really going to try to have him to report, hopefully, so that he can decide and bring something back to you all in November, right? Is that what we're we were doing? shooting for kind of the, the end of October, oh, beginning of November. Again, that just depends on how everything lines out with everything he's got going on and get the candidate scheduled. Seems like at the end of the year, everybody wants an assessment center. And, you know, from two or three going on here in Middle Tennessee to all the way in Far East Tennessee. So, uh, I don't know if it's the COVID, what it is. Maybe people haven't been doing anything because they didn't feel comfortable about getting together. But it seems like over the last couple of months, uh, it's been a assessment center season in the middle of East Tennessee, especially. I got a question. So what, to keep on what you're talking about right there, you guys do assessments all across the state. Yeah. And that fits to Bridgeville. And so you're interviewing or you're doing the assessments of different sizes of Department. Some, I'm sure, are full time, and some are volunteers. So what we've got to do. And so, looking at the job description that we have here in Travelton County, I'm going to assume for a second it's not changing any. Of course, you were the one to do that. Up. It's not going to change any. Well, yeah. I, I changed two things from their sample. From their sample. The only thing I changed was there, I put a residency requirement in there because there wasn't one in their sample. Yeah. I originally had it at 45 days to either be a citizen or a resident of Travelton County or move into Travelton County. 
given our housing market at that time and how fast things were going, I extended that to six months when we advertised it. And we actually lost a candidate who had applied, but looked at the housing market and had been trying for three months to find something and couldn't and didn't think he was going to be able to meet the residency requirements. So he withdrew the day before the interview. I can tell you as a realtor, it's tough in this county. Inventory is Well, we're, we're looking, going to the planning commission, we're looking at an apartment complex, another place that's going to be 30 plus houses, another one 20 houses. There's it's probably good. over 100 uh, housing units yeah. coming up from the planning commission just this next week. Well, this inventory is tough. I mean, that makes sense. So, to keep on my question, so given our size and what we have in front of us, and that minor adjustment, but still helpful, uh, does this look like there's anything we need to add to it, or is it okay? Or what I really it? think you have to build this job description to meet your community. Right, right. And, that's, calls, and you uh, see that, because yeah. you see the different communities. Is what we got on the books or in the job, is that going to be good for us? I mean, is that okay? I mean, do we need anything to it? That's a really hard question because 99% uh, of my advice comes straight out of a uh, consensus code, like well, you know, the officer code 101 or whatever. And um, so, you know, we're going to meet that. But if we do, then maybe nobody applies. Yeah, we don't want to raise the bar too high to where no one can apply for it. We don't want to raise the bar, we don't want to lower the bar too much that. I still think that's something, you know, it's easy for me to come up here and say we need to, and I know like I think the last time I submitted a uh, uh, job description that had a professional development plan in it to where no matter what you had over so many years, you have to get something else. Right. So uh, again, that's that's something you guys need to sort of decide on. Um, Yes, because when you talked about that, you said, hey, you might have a requirement that someone might not meet at that moment in time, but that that is actually in the, the job description that if they were the selected candidate, that they would have a certain amount of time to get to that level. Right. And, you know, even the mayor, if he were to, say, offer me the position, it could be contingent upon getting things. So even if it wasn't in the job description, the mayor could make that happen through an offer letter. Um, and that's what he had submitted last time, that if there was deficiencies for somebody that came in, the right. offer letter would say, hey, we, we want to look in this direction. If you don't have that training, you got to get it within, I think, it's just, six months, a year, something like that. It's just some flexibility. Yeah. Well, with this not being a full-time position, we actually had more people that were interested in it, but as soon as they saw it as a volunteer, we never heard from them. <laughs> Yeah, if this was a paid full time position, you'd have people, I mean, you'd have all kinds of people applying for this job just because of where it's at and the opportunity to really take a and build a brand new product on it. You like? I, I think a, a better way to phrase what you're asking is the job description we have typical for a community our size with a volunteer fire department. I would probably say yeah, uh, because just to be honest, a lot don't even have one. Um, so by having one, you're probably in the top 20%. Well, I've checked at other volunteer fire departments that have like one paragraph and a yeah. few bullet points. And that's why I said I pulled the job samples off the impacts of the website. They had two samples. The first one was very in-depth, and that's the one I went with. And it pretty had, you know, it had all the ICS and all these things about, based, you know, firefighting and all that right. stuff on there. And like I said, really the only thing I changed was it just have a residency requirement and I thought we ought to have one. So I'll put that on there and that's really the only thing I changed from the impacts of job description. Okay, any other questions or thoughts? Yes, sir. Well, I, I think one thing that's come up in times past, uh, the situation before, was, um, and I think in conversations with the mayor, and if I misspeak, please tell me, that he wanted to absolutely make sure, and Steve wanted to make sure, that what the way they were approaching this was what we wanted, what we needed, or what we thought was lacking in the last uh, situation we went through. Yeah. And I think if anybody had any specific questions, 
why didn't we do this last time or we're going to do this this time that's what they're looking for we're not going to get in that can of worms but we're going to have a major disagreement <laughs> I mean, exactly what happened last time just didn't like that the interview process was fine but what some of the commissioners had issues with was that some of the interviewers knew some of the candidates so yes, it was my understanding if that could be avoided it was fine because every, nobody seemed to have any issues every with the every process every candidate. yeah so then some of them formalized that knowledge and some didn't, you know. After every candidate left, each of those fire chiefs said, I know that guy I served with here, I did this with him, I did that with him. Each one of them said that about all three candidates. So they all knew the candidates. Okay, but I think that was one of the issues uh, that maybe we can avoid. And you've already said that we thought we could. I if we go this full process, we're looking I had, I'm really looking at the resumes as to who they put down. The part that I'm going to do different this time especially is review the resumes and make sure that somebody that wrote Steve Cross as a reference does not end up being a raider. Now I'll tell you right up front, even though those two names were on there, uh, the way we score, there's no way they could have fixed it. Uh, just because uh, you know, you take for instance the mayor and I, Mr. Ferguson, we're the graders, and, this, and the mayor knows this uh, candidate, so he gives him a three. But me and Mr. Ferguson, we thought he thirty got a pulse, and he's breathing on his own, so we get one and a half. If we average that, he still has affected that score because he knew the candidate. But the way we do it is. We all three would lay our score out on the table and then we get to discuss it. And then in order for us to get closer to the mayor's score, he has to convince us that we didn't hear some stuff or we didn't see some stuff. Or we have to convince him, you know, he didn't say that, he didn't do that. I mean, why are you doing that? So the next thing you know, the three of us come to one score, a consensus score. So even though I'm telling you, I've done this a bunch. That interview that day, I don't care who knew who, when it was over, the, the numbers are what they are. Uh, but I'll understand you all because it didn't look right. Some of us. And Some I'm of us didn't have you, yeah, I'm just telling you that uh, that day in time for that couple of hours, that is the way things scored. Now tomorrow is a different day. so. Different interview, different panel. You know, the candidates learn stuff when they go to things like this. You know, I don't know. I know there's a couple of the candidates in the room. I don't know if they ever been to something like that before. But the first time you go through an impasse interview or an assessment center, it's a learning process for you. And if you hadn't practiced that or hadn't practiced in a long time, you're not going to fare as well that first time. Now, if you do it two or three times this year, or come and work as an assessor with me at some point, you kind of get a peek behind the curtain and see how things operate. Yes, sir. Prior to starting this valid assessment process, is there a way you can get a written outline of what that process is, bring it to the committee so we can look at it and approve it, so to speak, and that way when the process starts, you're gonna be nobody having an issue with the I process? I can pretty much write up what I just said tonight. I'm not gonna tell you what my Interview questions are. Oh, well, yeah, I love that. Tell you, you know, that big yeah. I mean, I can give you the bullet points of what we're planning on doing and shoot them over to the mayor. But, you know, the, the role play, if I give it to one of y'all and no, no, Ken no, no. Cannon, I'm not talking you know, specifics. I'm just yeah, talking Yeah, I have to try to keep things as, as close as I can to my, my chest because it's not really an element of surprise, but if you have five or six candidates and three of them know what exactly what's going on that day and the other three don't, it's not fair and it's not valid at that point. So but you know I can tell you for sure we're gonna have an interview. As long as y'all sign off on this, we're gonna have an interview. We're gonna, have, awesome. we're gonna have a role play situation and we're gonna work through some sort of emergency incident. What about an in basket for administrative issues? That's one of our one of our deals, you know. If we chose that, that's not something that the mayor uh, asked me to do. Um, again, this is a working fire chief. 
Um, so we felt like based on the job description and the competencies that those three I just mentioned, there's, there's all kinds of stuff that we can do. Um, I mean, M Basket's is one of them, but you tell me. What's an M Basket? I think the administrative things where if they're knowledge on administrative, like say if they're going to write a grant, have the knowledge and what knowledge they do have, their experience doing it. That's not going to come out in the end basket. Yeah. An end basket is you get <coughs> an X number of things to do. Fire, fire, fire. And then I tell you, you come into office today, uh, you've got a plan or something happens in like two hours. And how are you going to handle these 25 things in the next two hours? That's an end basket. Now, what you're talking about is like a work sample. If, if I give you a bunch of facts and then have the candidate write a staff report, a grant narrative, those type things, that is a work sample. So that's another measure that, that can be employed. But again, it's just how many and what you want to do to get down to the the candidate you have won. So I know that last time when we talked about this before the interview process took place, that we did talk about tactical situations in our discussion, and some of us thought that that would be in there, and it wasn't. And I know we talked a little bit about what I call it the press conference, is what I call it, and that maybe they're all terminology. But as we come to find it later, that wasn't there either. But that time, that can be fixed now. <coughs> And so there are some things that we, in the resume, that I think the candidates think when they turn in a resume that they're going to be looked at, and I know they will be this time. And I think that will help to a degree because maybe you go into an interview and think, well, they've already seen my resume, maybe I don't have to talk about that. Well, I'll give you a big hint to the first question of the. Of the oh, you might do that. <laughs> <laughs> the first question is always about your resume. You know, you know, all of our questions are three parts. The first part is yes or no. Do you have the knowledge and skills to be the fire chief for Hartsfield? Hopefully the answer is yes. And then the question is, tell me about your education and experience. That's the resume right there. So that and the candidate, you both were there. That's what y'all were asked, right? Um, I always ask that first question. And then usually there's a follow-up after that that says, based on your education and experience, what makes you think you'd be successful in Hartsfield? And then they get an opportunity to tell us about that. So that is where the resume gets judged because the acceptable is the minimum qualifications according to this thing, this job description. Outstanding is all these other things that we could have on top of that. So when you say the resume didn't get graded, it didn't get graded like this. But question number one got graded, and everybody got a grade on it. So based on how they communicated their education, their certifications, their college, whatever it was, that got graded. And I'll just tell you right up front, that got graded. And that's everybody's opportunity to sit down and go back through with the panel, all my certifications, all my college education, all my experiences, all these things, all my successes. I mean, it's your time to shine. That's where people need to spend the absolute most of their interview time at is on that first question. Because it's all about you. And then almost every question I ask after that is always something to do with your past experience. Because past experience is the absolute best predictor of future performance. So it's hard to study for my interview because you lived it. You lived it, basically. So just about every question will be something to do about your past. And what have you done for an employer somewhere in your past? It's a very good interview, man. <laughs> it, what do you think? It's pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'm telling, telling the panel the truth, right? Just about every question dealt with your past. And question one is about your resume. Any other other community members have anything else that they want to add to any of this that we talked about? Any other questions or thoughts or comments? 
Yes, sir. I will say I'm, I'm really uh, good with the timeline that the mayor has laid out. And I'll, uh, like I've said many, too many times, this is something we need to move on and get resolved. And uh, I think that's, if we can do it in that amount of time, that would be super good. I know we need them to be part of the process. They do this all the time. Yeah. We need to not second guess everything unless we have an absolute reason to, and uh, let them proceed with what they've laid out to do. Well, in all my assessments, this was the only time that I know of, because I've never, I never review applications. That's the city or the county job. I'm on one. Here I will, <laughs> because, because of this. Um, uh, I don't want there to be any doubt in your mind, any doubt that everything is fair and on board. I mean, like I said, two candidates in the room right now that I know for sure will make the last. I know both of these candidates. I like both of these candidates. But I can't call either one of them up and give either one of them more information than the other. Um, the other thing for a uh, city a couple weeks ago, assistant chief level job, paid a good paying job. So, uh, and the uh, HR director called me and says, hey, candidate, whatever has a question. How do I address that? I said, answer the question in writing and reply it back to all the people coming to the assessment center. And that way, you know, maybe they had the same question, but whether they did or didn't, they got the answer. Yeah. And that way we keep it as, as flat as we can, as fair as we can. And uh, I mean, like I said, I know two of the past candidates, I don't know if they'll be on it this time or not, but um, I just carry a high level of integrity and I'm gonna make sure your your thing is as fair as I know how to do it. Uh, and that's just all I know to do. Uh, and um, I consider it an honor to be up here working for y'all. I really do. Uh, I call it serving those who serve because those firefighters out there that serve y'all, they're all heroes. I mean, they're heroes not because they're gonna give their life tonight for you, it's because they may have to. And they step up to do it every day. And when I'm up here working, they do the same for me. And I'm so appreciative of that. So uh, I want y'all to get a good quality fire chief that can lead your city into the future. And uh, and uh, that's all, all I'll say about that. I could talk to you pretty much all night about it, but I'm really here just to make sure you're kind of on board with the process that I'm proposing for you. One thing I like to say about the process that's very important to me, just me myself, I'm not speaking for the committee or anything else, is the objectivity. And I don't know, is it really going to be hard for you to find the scores that none of the scores know anybody? Is that hard? Or hard to say because you don't have the candidates, but I mean, is that going to take a, I mean, with the time they were talking about, I'm going to try to find you some candidates within, I mean, uh, raiders within an hour, an hour and a half of here. That way they can drive in and drive out today and reach out to you and have them put them up in a hotel. Uh, you know, I can bring people from anywhere in the state here. Right. Uh, I mean, I've got resources to bring people from Memphis to Knoxville or Bristol or whoever, but that requires us to put them up in a hotel. And, and so I'm thinking if we can stay an hour, hour and a half away, they can drive here this morning, according to how many candidates we got, this three, uh, three deal, uh, when we do three measures, uh, I normally start at 8 a.m. Uh, the first hour is to train the assessors, I mean, yeah, the, uh, the rate of the assessors. So we generally get our first candidate at 8.45, and we get, especially if we do the role play, and I give them a little bit of time to prepare for that. And then while I'm finishing up my training, they're preparing. So we get started at nine. And generally by the end of the day, uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock, we did four candidates. So if we have more than four, we go into two days. And uh, I will get each candidate done that day. Though. I don't make the candidate come back two days, but the assessors will because I don't, I gotta have the same assessors for the whole deal. I can't, I can't have three today and three different ones tomorrow because they make sure I get one different. Uh, if we have
had so many candidates that it was gonna take several days, I would bring two assessment teams in and I would have one team maybe rating the interview and a separate team rating the other two measures. It's still very consistent, it's still very valid, but I can't have two different teams say rating the interview because today's team might rate it a little different than tomorrow's team. But so I have, in some instance where we had cities that were trying to rebuild and might have 18 or 20 candidates, I have two assessment teams coming in just so they weren't there for a week. We had a hotel at the front of that. You got one out here. Well, the mayor was talking about it. You can't go out there six times. We can't get them a ride back into town. We've got some cots there in the closet. Take them down to the firehouse. Do any members have any other questions about this? Then, uh, does anybody from the public not necessarily a member want to speak? Mr. Kennedy. <clears throat> Mr. Cross, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to understand the logic of the model on which you rate and score applicants. If, let's say, Ben, I've hired hundreds of people and held hundreds of interviews and been trained for years and years in HR practices, so I'm, I'm somewhat and least somewhat familiar sure. with it. But the scoring by consensus, yes, that is something that I'm struggling to reconcile on how that works. So if you have three interviewers and they all come up with three, let's just say, well, let's use it as an example. Mr. Chambers scores a three and these two gentlemen score a one, a one and a half. Mr. Chambers is a dynamic personality and can tell ice to an Eskimo that he can convince these gentlemen to start to see his side. Or the other way around. Maybe he is horrible at being able to sell his side of it. And these two gentlemen are, are real estate agents and we know how bad they are. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. so I, I, I struggle to reconcile the, the consensus of that. Uh, now, I have a new, I'm going to two part this. The other thing is, is you keep talking about competencies by which they're going to be measured. Who sets those competencies? Competencies are they national fire standards of command and control? Or would that competency equate in Hartsville, Tennessee, as it would a district chief in Knoxville, Tennessee, a major metropolitan area? The competencies are going to be based on the job descriptions, what the mayor expects from the position, a lot of things like that. And I'm going to bring some of those national standards in myself too, but I can't just sit here and tell you what I do right now. I have to sit down with this job description and just really make it make sense. Now, as far as the consensus thing, that's part of my job is to make sure that one person don't run a rough shot over the other person. If I see that happen, then I, I you know I I call foul, and then I have to have a, a talk with the panel. I've never had that problem yet. The people I work with. Have, I mean, the people I'm going to probably ask to come here, I've worked with before, and I'm going to know those folks, and I'm going to know how they do, and so I'm not going to have that problem. That's not going to be a problem. The people that's coming here are all going to be on the same page as far as they're going to be professional, and they're not going to know any of your candidates, so they're not going to know who to pull for. So, uh, to be fair, yeah. our mayor, probably a fabulous lawyer, but he's not a firefighter. Right. That's not his job. So how is it that someone who is not a fire, let's say I'm in charge, I don't know crap about firefighting, okay? I never will and don't need to. But how could I design a parameter by which you have to rate competencies for a job that I don't understand? It seems like there'd be some sort of a national standard or a common competency that's used in major professional. Well, I'll give you an example. Like when we're doing the, uh, the emergency incident. Uh, there's national standards, there's incident command processes. You know, the mayor's not gonna tell us, I mean, that's gonna be my competency because I've got that, you know, that's my sword chief. The things that uh, that might come into play, budgeting, is that an issue? Uh, policy writing, is that an issue? Analytics, you know, is the chief here gonna be uh, charged with uh, analyzing incident statistics and training, you know, those type things, those, I 
I guess you call them soft skills, you know. Uh, can the chief talk to a problem employee and bring them around to resolution and get good behavior and still have a good morale at the end of the day? Those type things are really not standards for that. It's that you watch the person, you see how they interact with the person, interpersonal dynamics, and then we score. I mean, it's it's a really good process. And, and I can't invite you to come, but I'm telling you, it would be, if you see the process, you would definitely believe the process. Well, I would just say that's the false premise is that I set the standards. I don't, he, he gets a copy of the job. Yeah. He asked me about the local uh, issues with the fire department or yeah. local specific, and then he uses that yeah. structure of the questions and everything. I, other than providing him information that he asked for, That's I don't have anything to do with structure. Right. Well, but I'm referring to the statement he made that his competencies are based on the standards or requirements by which you did the job description. Yes, and that came from him. Yeah. Yes, and if it was, and like you know, if it's not in the job description that the fire chief is going to develop a budget, and the mayor says fire chief's going to develop a budget, then there might be a budget question in there, or there could be a budget uh, work practice. I mean, a uh, work sample. I mean, I could give somebody. Uh, a I didn't even quit talking, but I, I could give them a 30 page budget and say, the mayor has says cut the budget by so much. Go in here and figure out how you're going to do it. You know, can they do it? You know, I give uh, candidates uh, two or three pages of data and put them at a computer and said, write me a staff report. I give them a, a national standard and give them two hours to develop me a program. And then, we get to grade their writing skills, and then they come in and stand at a podium and communicate that new program to their fire department. And we grade that. So, man, there's this all kinds of stuff. Well, my inference was not that he was going to yeah, the yeah. scope, but my, inf my, my question was is if you do this in Memphis, Knoxville, Nashville, Hartsville, Lewisburg, do you use a nationally set of standards and fire service that you go by? That's Some of the things are going to be very similar because I don't care what city you're in, there's the same benchmarks you're going to hit on working a structure fire or a hazmat call or a plane crash or a school bus. I mean, we have certain, certain, and again, when you look at, say, uh, 15 or 20 benchmarks on a structure fire, if a candidate puts them all in order and they, they've proven they kind of know what to do on that, they may score a two on everything. If they put them all in good order and then expand on, uh, you know, explaining what they're doing, maybe in why, maybe they get even better score. So, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, it's a national, uh, we use acronyms on a lot of things on, on uh, fighting fires and mitigating incidents. We also use national incident management system. I integrate those two and come up with all these benchmarks. And as long as the candidate hits benchmarks in a good order and explains them, they do very well. If they get them out of order and they get them one, they come in with a pulse. You see what I'm saying? If they do a lot better than they've got a pulse, they get them maybe a little out of order, maybe they get close to a two. If they get them in order, get them in good shape, they're two, two plus. And then if they get them in order, expand on them, maybe explain to the panel why they did it this way or that way, the score keeps going up. And I'll give you an example. He and I talked earlier this week and he said they normally do, it's like a press conference. The fire chief stand up there and do it. Well, not the fire chief doesn't do press conferences every place. Some places, you go to Wilson County, they got a public relations officer that does it. The yeah. fire chief did not. And I specifically told him, I don't want my fire chief coming out of fire and talking to the press. I'm, they're talking to me first and then I'll relate whatever it is because we found out, I did in that December fire, you had four or five different points of view and the fire chief didn't know what was going on with the other ones. Well, within two hours of me being notified of that fire, I interviewed everybody at that scene that was in command and requested videos of that thing. So I interviewed all of them and fire chief saw something different than what the water department saw. But they hadn't had time to talk about it. I went ahead and called them and then they came in and did a pile and all this stuff. And it's what they're doing all over the place. I can figure out how a lot of mayors are telling them. Hey, let's come back, let's all get together, let's all get a, a comprehensive view of what's going on. Don't run up and start talking to somebody when you're just out here and haven't been able to talk to anybody else and see what's going on, haven't got a full picture of it. So what we decided is 
probably what we're going to focus more on is dealing with the public. Like if somebody called up the fire chief or came in and had a question, or one of the commissioners had a question, doing that one-on-one, -on -one, addressing that with them, doing that more of a focus rather than press conferences, because other than Mr. Gregory, we don't really get a lot of press interaction with our fire chief. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another thing, you know, you, we make these things fit the community. Um, I did an assistant chief a couple weeks ago, like I said, down south in North Tennessee. That, that was one of the big things the chief wanted. Is do an assistant chief in my press conference because I'm out of town some of the class, I'm out of town these different things. Sometimes being a city manager leave, your assistant chief's left in charge of the city while they're gone. And so I developed them a press conference. So, like I said, it, this thing is customized to your community to a point. Any other comments, questions from the public or any other community member? I just one last thing. So, when we do this, just I'm really beating this hammer on the head. I, I, any score that comes in on any candidate, they don't, the people who are doing the scoring don't know anything. It's what I have. You're What's probably that? not going to find that. Mm -hmm. You're probably that not going to find that. You can find a lot of full-time firefighters that either trained with each other or done a disaster response or something like that, and they know each other. Same thing with the volunteer firefighters. We, we have volunteers coming down from Kentucky to help out the fire, but we go to help them. They all come all over the place. A lot of volunteer firefighters know each other. I used to race in Macon County, a little quarter of mile, well, eighth of mile flat dirt track. I knew somebody racing in Rossburg, Ohio. Yeah, but I that's the issue you find. I'm going to try to find people yeah, that don't know your people. It's good for people to know your people. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, that's good. But that intimate knowledge and, you know, that type of thing is what I'm not looking for. I'm not looking for somebody that a candidate put as a reference. I'm not looking for a cousin. I'm not looking for somebody that's kin. Now, I'm going to try my best to find people they don't know. But when you have people that, I'm telling you, if I was going, if I was applying for this thing, you'd have a really hard time finding somebody in the park service that don't know me. So how do we do that? That would be unfair for me not to be able to interview you because you couldn't find somebody that don't know me in the fire service or maybe in the law enforcement. <laughs> I'm joking. Well, we, we only really had, we had four candidates and one dropped out. So right. we did the three last time. So I'm not Well, again, uh, the, the two that's in the room, they've been in the fire service for a while. Uh, again, they've either worked incidents uh, around the region, around the country. Uh, people know each other, but do you know each other that good to put you on a resume? <laughs> well, what happened last time is you had one of the candidates left. He wasn't a reference. You have to assume the candidate left. But I know that guy. We served here. He's a really good guy. He does a really good job. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he could have been an impressed agent. And as soon as he said that stuff, Mr. Cross said the same thing he asked all three of them. Did your knowledge of this candidate influence your score any whatsoever? And they all three said the same thing. I'm here to pick the best candidate and rate them how they give the best scores. I don't care who they are. I do the same thing in my department. That's what we're doing here. That's what you're going to get into. Just because they're not on that resume, and some of them, they'll say, well, I, they didn't know their name, but as soon as they saw them, oh, I know that guy. I don't know his name is, but I know we served here, we served that. So that's the kind of issue you're going to get to. And that's what I'm saying you're going to find out a lot of them know each other. I can't believe they don't know by name. They just know, well, I know yes. that guy served in here. As soon as they see him, they don't know him. They just don't know their name. That's what I'd say, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. If you had to go outside that hour, hour and a half, that's Alan Mayor, Pat Mayor too, is it possible to have accommodations? I know a lot of police assessment center in Metro Nashville, we went out of, across the country yeah. to get it. I don't know if you can pick with me where you want, it's just how much you want I mean, to pay. As a, we just don't want people to know yeah. well. And like the next, the fire chief from the next town that's worked with them on fire. We're not going to do that. That's yeah. not, well, that's what we had. We did it last time just because it was so convenient. I knew those fire chiefs, and, and they, I'm telling you, the mayor, he summed it right up. They're, they were all three very passionate about this thing, and I'm telling you, they were not going to cheat one way or the other. And, and, and to me, I can see the other side of that equation. Well, They're sure. the one that's doing mutual aid with us, and they want somebody that they know they can work with. So, I, I mean, I see both sides of that equation. But, uh, you know, how far you have to go is how far you have to go. If we have to put them up, we'll find ways to put them up. 
you know, we have to explain what we did, the mayor, the committee, to the public. And, you know, we have got to have something that is above, I hate to use the word reproach, but above reproach. Yeah. And, and that, that's, 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 it's not always, like we say, it's not always reality, it's perception. Once we get a list of the candidates and know whether we're talking about a day or three days, I think at that point we can make some, a little bit better decisions on that part. Uh, an issue. Uh, I live in Christiana, Tennessee. And I'm telling you, when I pull out of the parking lot out here, unless there's a crash between here and home, it's one hour. So an hour drive is a chunk of Middle Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Over 15 minutes, you know, is a chunk of Middle Tennessee. Uh, you know, yeah, we went next. I mean, I was looking at demographics. You look at the chiefs I called in here. Two of them were very similar to your city. One was a lot larger. Mm -hmm. So we got, you know, really three different perspectives. We had two combination fire departments and one part of the fully paid big department uh, in a different county, but mm -hmm. still it was close. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we had three really good assessors if they had to put, you know, if the candidates had to put them in as reference. And you know, when I was old, they called and asked. I think it just happened because if they had knew they were the reference, they would have told them when I called them. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I guess we might, do we want to set a meeting? Do you need to draw this up to the committee? Y'all need to draw up some things, the criteria, what we're going to be doing, so y'all can review it one more time before it gets put into action. Before we make a motion on that, just let it come back to us and then we can like what we see. Is that okay? I mean, we got a timetable for that. What was the time that was like October, November? So I guess we're going to look No, we're advertising on September 24th. 24th, so you have to make it pretty quick. So. They give the time to put it together. Is that okay? You still, I know you asked us for some of those things. Okay, Gary, okay. Um, and then we'll get the calendar out September 3rd. The advertising on the 24th. The advertising doesn't necessarily, I mean, we kind of set on that, are, are we not? What the criteria is? I mean, that's not going to change it, is it? Oh, no, no, it's not. The advertising go ahead and go out. It's just the basic outline what you're doing. No specifics. I'm not going to put it in now. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah, how does anybody work on the 24th of September? That's this month. It will already. Can uh, I have to have the idea on Monday, so it'll be going into the idea on the 21st. Yeah, right. But, but so well, we'll maybe he can send us all a, a, an email or something if yeah. so we can see it then. You can have the candidate interview. Process going, and we can still look at what he's going to do. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's I mean, if there's it. something that gives y'all heartburn, we can tweak something as far as that goes. That doesn't affect the uh, you know, applying for the position because that's already been set as to what the criteria is. You can do the 24th, we wouldn't do that soon. If that's enough time for him to do it, that's the question. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm planning on knocking that out in the morning and sending it to the mayor. There you go. Oh, oh, just because I don't want to be worried about it over the weekend. I want to have a good weekend. Uh, Saturday is my birthday. I don't want to give my birthday up. It's all these things. <laughs> what I got to say, just what the mayor said while ago is coming up to be built here. We're already way above what we, the last time we had this. So the person coming in is going to take over. There's going to be so much changing, so much changing to be done. Look at the apartment complex. I don't know how many big, how many apartments, but you know that's usually what two, two stories. I don't know the specifics on this. I just seen a site plan, and it doesn't say the height of the building. That's what we're going to get more yeah, on the plan. You know, we, you're looking at way the, the town is growing so, county is growing so fast that uh, all the county might be a little bit, a little bit more to know more or to be able to train more for that purpose. Well, I think personally, you're you're closing in on an employee instead of a volunteer, and uh, um, and especially when you get an employee, you can expect a lot more. I think you know when you start planning for apartment complexes and neighborhoods, 
Somebody needs to be eyes on that stuff, making sure you got built in fire protection, fire hydrants, all this infrastructure that you need to take care of that. And we can't just let, what, well, Ryan, y'all know that. Speaking of which, our post department is evaluating whether or not they want to improve sampler systems in the new developments. Awesome. And that might be something that we might want to come up and discuss. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> This is the public safety committee, right? Yep. We uh, tentative date, Gary West, uh, 22nd, which is a Tuesday. Uh, I know 24th is y'all's regular training date. So I'd ask him if he could do the 22nd or the 24th. 22nd is what he threw out to me. It would be best for them. Gary yeah. West is coming up to do a sprinkler demonstration? Yeah, they're going to do, they're going to awesome. try to do a live burn and okay. do a sprinkler side burn. Side burn. Um, is it a side by side burn? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's awesome. Y'all are going to, are really going to like that. Yeah. Well, we wanted, we're looking at this new kind of adoption, whether we're going to put sprinkler systems in it or not on residential. Yeah. We already had it for some commercial. Right. But um, we were just trying to get factual information and Gary, I'd reach out to him and him and Brian. Him and Brian um, would be great. Um, really look at this with an open mind. And just know this is your community. And if I want to live here, I need to meet your expectations. Uh, I built a house three years ago in Rutherford County. It's not a requirement, but I sprinkled it because I know the benefit. I don't get a $30 a year off on my insurance, so it's not an insurance uh, thing. But I'm telling you, it's peace of mind. Um, it's peace of mind. I know. I know when I'm in Bristol, it's Tennessee, and my wife and grandkids are sleeping at home, they're not going to die tonight. I am trusting God. What was your real world per square foot cost? One dollar and a quarter. New construction. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. the Go into an older house and it costs more to put one in. Right? Oh, oh, yeah, right. Right. And Gary, Gary West, when he's here, he can tell you exactly because when he. Uh, Association, that was a contingency. You got to have a house permit. So he retrofitted his house in the last year or so. Right. So he's going to know real world numbers on that and she and county, especially. I know what it cost new construction three years ago in, in Christiana, Tennessee. Um, you know, my heads aren't like these, they're recessed mm -hmm. and they look nice. I'm telling you, you walk in my house, you never notice it. Uh, I can show you some pictures, but I'm just telling you, it gives me such peace of mind to know. Uh, the Christiana Volunteer Fire Department, they're exactly five miles from my house. I mean, exactly five miles from my house. The ambulance station is about a mile and a half from my house. Uh, I couldn't afford to have a paramedic stand by for the old guy that I did for a fireman there, so. Mm -hmm. um, everybody, next Thursday, September the 11th, Calendars. There's, I'm looking at the calendar that Amy has sent out, unless there's been an addition to it. There's no meetings right now. Next Thursday night, September the 11th. Tuesday, there's law enforcement at 8, and Monday the 14th, there's planning, but there's nothing in between. If y'all want to meet this time next week, September 11th is Friday. Well, well, September 11th on Friday. Is it Friday the 10th? Sorry. 10th is the fire department meeting. Well, I mean, we, we can fit it in at that time if we're punch for time. No, I mean, you were not punch for time. So let's go 17th looks good. Another year for the services. No, it's the 17th. How's the 17th look? 17th is nothing that I know of other than the Board of Education. It gives us time, too. Yeah, if you have a dead end, the bi-dead. Yeah, it's the 17th. You need a special call meeting. Your five days notice, you're pretty good, but it has to be usually able to see when it's put in a, a newspaper or okay. what method did you use to do it. Keep that newspaper. Not the president. I get it in the next week. Yes. Six o'clock. I'll tell you for the elected officials in the room, um, I don't get a dime from the sprinkler people, but you adopt new codes. 
the residential park sprinkler requirement is in the new codes. Now, the state requires you to check it out uh, when you adopt, but you can also put it right back in for the two thirds majority of the right. elected officials. Two thirds. Two thirds. Two thirds majority. That's a legacy. When you guys hang a light now that's just set to be busted wide open with development. Passing that sprinkler ordinance and making that a requirement, that's a legacy that you will never outlive. Because there will be people that don't die in this community because of you. I'm telling you right up front. Uh, it's the same way with uh, the, uh, and I know Nashville, whatever, uh, you know, we got a law passed uh, last year about firefighter cancer. Uh, our friend that over in Sparta. Uh, Barry Brady got colon cancer, firefighter. So they passed that bill to him, got it passed. Now firefighters get cancer. It's a worker's comp, it's a line of duty death. It's all these things. So my friend Barry Brady saved lives living. He's gonna save more of us by his death. And it's the same way if you guys really pay attention to this sprinkler thing and enact that here. I know there might be some controversy about it, but weather the storm and make it your legacy. It'll make your community so much more safer. Call the communities that already do it, and they're still busting at the seams. And it really takes a whole bunch of pressure off these firefighters. Um, the residents are safer, your firefighters are safer, because a sprinkle home, they're not gonna have to go in and fight the fire. Just to be honest. They're not gonna be, uh, I mean, y'all have sprinkler home, I guess, I know I know, I know of one in Nashville, I've been in it. Uh, but, uh, when you have those sprinkled homes, we get killed in, in burning homes, the citizens die in burning homes, and you put that sprinkler system in it, you fix both of those problems. And that's your legacy. And when Gary West comes up here, that's my soft and get up. I just call it that's got a gun post. So September 17th, six o'clock. Would you have time? I don't know, I'll have to look and see. You're asking a whole lot. I know, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, but we'll say that that's okay with this question. And, just, and I don't know if that's going to be here in the community center at the courthouse. We've had some contractors come in, give us estimates, and look at it, and the damage is a little bit worse than initially thought. And if we have to tear up that floor, you can still get in the front door, but then we lose our ADA entrance, and so you can't be, you're not going to be able to hold meetings in there because we can't. You just need to do the Just tell everybody to do it here. That's so, right. Unless there's, unless there's something ready. going on, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. all I have to check and okay. see. Because we didn't know until earlier today another company uh, came in and looked at it, and it's got under that linoleum because it was all the way up past that back staircase, and that linoleum just started to bubble, and so it got worse than the initial fall. Mr. Buckmaster, is there any reason we could use the train room at the fire hall if we had to? No, no. I'm going to speak back on the fire. Is there any other business? Oh, she's got to have a public comment. Any more public comment? I've kind of already got that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've already did that. Yeah. All right. Motion adjourned. All right. Adjourned.